Oh boy. Uh, Bree and Robbie had uh, another debate on rising about DEI. And there was one part of this discussion. I was like, Oh, they're talking about college admissions. Let me jump into this. Let me jump in because I think there are strong points made by both of them, but this all came about, this discussion came about because of the libs of TikTok. You guys remember this woman, there's controversy over the fact that she was appointed to a key position in the department of education. I think it's the Oklahoma department of education. And people are saying that she was not qualified for that position. So is she technically a DEI hire, right? That's what they're saying. So DEI is different in different circumstances. Like I told you, when I worked at MIT, a female hire was considered a DEI hire, uh, a female college student was considered a DEI, uh, a student, so to speak just because of the overwhelmingly male population uh, at MIT. But let's go ahead and get into this conversation. This is a very interesting discussion. And like I said, they both make good points. Let's dive in. <laughs> Top Oklahoma school official Ryan Walters has appointed Libs of TikTok head Chaya Ratchik to the Library Media Advisory Committee at the State Department of Education. Libs of TikTok often post videos about LGBTQ plus teachers in schools, classifying them as groomers. Walter said in a statement, Haya Rychik is on the front lines showing the world exactly what the radical left is all about, lowering standards, porn in schools, and pushing woke indoctrination on our kids. Her unique perspective is invaluable as part of my plan to make Oklahoma schools safer for kids and friendlier to parents, per the Huffington Post. It's interesting that he raises the idea of lowering standards, given that I couldn't find any evidence that uh, this woman would be qualified to do any job in education whatsoever. And there are some obvious conflicts of interest here to have someone working on a school board that seems not to respect the basic rights of gay people in this country to even be teachers in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it's the the board for the, for the library specifically. Um, I mean, I have a hard time seeing this as anything other than um, of kind of own the libs stunt. Uh, I think she has, you know, every right to post on social media criticisms of wokeness and the other things she sees. But just as I wouldn't want like Robin D'Angelo or Ibram X. Kendi on the library board because they're like deeply committed left wing activist type people with shoddy scholarship. Um, I similarly don't think this person who's kind of a performer social media personality. You bring up X Kendi and here. Robin D'Angelo scholarship makes Raya Chaddick, uh, Raya Chaddick, I should say, makes their scholarship look like their um, uh, Nobel Prize laureates uh, who should be esteemed above all else. They have, at the bare minimum, written books uh, and been degreed in some areas of rele relevant expertise here. Um, I mean, Raya Chaddick, this is someone who um, has been part of many a kind of cancel culture book ban campaign against a number of books that are considered to be classics in American literature. Uh, it really does seem like certain Republicans are pushing a kind of authoritarian overreach that has already been proven to be not especially successful politically. We're now in a realm where the candidates in the Republican primary who branded themselves largely as anti-woke candidates, both Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy, have fallen out. Um, even Donald Trump doesn't hit those notes as hard as those two ever did. And it seems like that lesson is slowly perhaps being going to be learned in other parts of the country. We'll see what kind of local pushback there is to this clearly kind of a political appointment that doesn't seem well tailored to actually improving the education of kids in Oklahoma. Let me pause here for a second. So long story short, this woman from libs of TikTok is not qualified for the position. Now, where are all the people like Bill Ackman who came after Claudine Gray and said she was a DEI hire? Why isn't Bill Ackman speaking out against this woman getting this position at the Department of Education and she has no experience in that field? Why isn't he calling that a DEI hire? It goes on, it gets way for it. Yeah, Oklahoma ranks 48th out of 50 states for the quality of education, so they have a long way to go. Um, again, I don't have any problem with efforts to get 
um, to have parents exercise some control over whether there are graphically, the pornographic books on the shelves or age-inappropriate material. Um, some of this is certainly going too far and banning or having or resulting in, in Florida and other places, uh, titles being taken off the shelves that I think are perfectly fine. Um, this seems honestly like a case where most reasonable people can draw a clear line that, again, the one book with the picture of someone performing fellatio on a dildo is not age appropriate for the school library and the blue. That has nothing to do with this woman being hired for a position that she wasn't qualified for, though. Twist eye is fine, and like we don't need to have some big fight over it, or I wish we didn't. Uh, for, fortunately, we do, because these book bans are happening all across the country. Uh, the response to this has obviously been varied. Ken Klippenstein weighed in. Obviously, we have him on a guest in the show all the time, and he is known for doing reporting that are based on uh, FOIA requests. He quote tweeted this story from Rolling Stone, writing, FOIA time, that tweet has gotten over 18,000 likes, and there's a lot of pushback and anger in the replies. The obvious implication here is that because she's now a part of uh, uh, of the government that she is now vulnerable to getting these freedom of information requests and who knows what that might turn yep. up i don't know if that's something that she wants to necessarily expose herself to up until this point she's largely been a private citizen who's able to been able to have the protections of a, of a private citizen now let's fast forward till we get to the part about ah this part right here because here's the other thing there was this statement from Charlie Kirk about not uh, feeling comfortable with the black pot. Listen to Story this. Yes. hits so hard because we've all been in the back of a plane when the turbulence hits or when you're flying through a storm and you're like, I'm so glad I saw the guy with the right stuff and the square jaw get into the cockpit before we took off. And I feel better now. Thank no, you. I mean, about like, that. you want to go thought crime? Like, I'm sorry. If I see a black pilot, I'm going to be like, boy, I hope he's qualified. Well, well, that's the you wouldn't have done that. You wouldn't have. You no, wouldn't have done that not, before. That's not an immediate. No, you wouldn't that's have done not that who I am. That's no. not what I believe. No, that is who you are. And just, I mean, just, just what? So to that point, with the libs of the libs of TikTok chick being appointed in that position, is Charlie going to ask and wonder if she's qualified? She's not. This is where it gets it gets a little heated. Yeah, I mean, what he's saying, though, is that because of and I don't know that this is what is in place at United, but because of affirmative action or race based hiring or admissions, um, it causes some people to uh, wrongly and unfairly question whether people who are admitted or hired under those specifications are thus are then not as qualified as other people, which is very, I'm sure, damaging and racist toward those people, which is why we just shouldn't practice, we should practice colorblind hiring and admissions. Well, okay. There's a lot of things that should happen that just don't happen. <clears throat> the reason why, the reason why they even have these things in place is because people were not practicing colorblind hiring and admissions. That's why. Now, one of the things I can tell you, a lot of jobs today, particularly say the professional jobs, a lot of the professional jobs today, when you submit your application, most of the time these applications are online. A lot of these companies in the HR department, they have an ATS, right? So ATS is the applicant tracking system. Typically what happens is, your resume goes through that system. The system picks up certain keywords from the resume, usually words that are tailored to the job description. This is why you're supposed to rewrite your resume a couple of times, depending on the description or the job you're applying for, right? So it'll pick up a couple of those things. And then those resumes, the ones that tend to match the job description more, are sent over to HR first, usually they pick between those and they decide, okay, which ones am I going to send to the hiring manager? And then the hiring manager goes through the applications that are sent to them. So to that point, even when it comes to DEI, 
you still have to have the keywords and usually the keywords are in reference to the qualifications for the job. You still have to have the, the keywords that's going to trigger the ATS system in the first place for the HR manager to actually pull your resume because there's hundreds of resumes. OK, so like one job can have like 200 people comply for like one job. So it has to trigger those keywords that have to do with the job district description and your experience. So even in the case of a lot of these hires where people say it's a DEI hire, usually they still have somewhat of the ex some experience in reference to the job, unless it's an entry level position. Listen to this part. Well, I think it really demonstrates a lot of ignorance um, uh, about what the affirmative action process actually is. The point is that if you have two qualified candidates, you can then move to other factors to try to get more demographic diversity or economic diversity, people who are poor, people who are from different parts of the country, things like that, at least when we're talking about college admissions. Um, if you want to live in a world where people, you know, I mean, everybody in college- That's not how it's worked for college admissions. It but. is how it's worked. That's literally, quota systems were made unconstitutional in the 1970s, so that's quite literally right. how affirmative action policies work. I mean, and it's certainly black not. pilots have to, it is, it's and black pilots not. have they to use pass all all of the same laws and rule and regulations and rules, obviously, as white pilots. Court decisions in the early so, 2000s, they used systems that assigned points to people based on race. Right. That's not a quota system. So that. So let me jump in here, folks, because I come from this field, right? So I worked in the university system for over 10 years, and I actually have been a part of admission committees multiple times. So I'm going to tell you what happens to those applications. Get ready. Here we go. So. When you apply to these universities, first and foremost, for those of us that are on the admissions committee, the applications are filtered, at least from my experience, are filtered first by merit. How many of you knew that? Not by race, not by gender, merit. So this is where your SAT scores, or if you're applying to grad school, your uh, GMAT, your GRE, this is where those things actually matter. So we sort the applications based on your test scores first. After that was GPA. So what I can tell you from my experience, oftentimes most of the black applicants and remember, I worked at I worked at some pretty top schools, right? So I worked at MIT, I worked at Boston University, I worked at Harvard University. So just keep that in mind. So most of the time, a lot of the black applicants don't even fall into that filter system for the first two qualifications. The test scores came first, the GPA came second. Just FYI, I'm telling you how we did this. Then there's other things. There's other factors. Extracurricular activities. That's always a plus. It's always a bonus to see that you're, you know, they want a, well, a well-rounded student. That's like this thing. So they want that. Uh, if you have a part-time job, I always felt that that was a good thing. But believe it or not, a lot of these admission committees don't actually see that as a good thing over extracurricular activities. You actually benefit more if you have been in school organizations or clubs, or if you played a sport, let's say you were part of band, that actually helps your application and makes it stronger than if you put on your application that you had a part-time job. I don't agree with that. I don't because I think, you know, I know when I was in high school, one of my friends had a part-time job, not by choice, but because she had to work because her mom could not work. So you never know people's financial situation. So I think that having a part-time job is just as important as being a part of a school organization, right? There's also this factor. Not everybody can participate in school organizations and clubs because their parents can't pick them up after school. Not everybody has that that option or that opportunity, but those are kind of those are the things that they would look at. Here's where the DEI part comes in. Now, I didn't went through all of that. We didn't went through all of that. Then there's the factor of, OK, we have all these applicants. Whoa, 
all of the top applicants are male. So then obviously they're going to obviously try to find a way to incorporate more females. Then there's the racial aspect. Obviously they're going to try to find a way to incorporate more people, black people, Asian people, et cetera. Right. But the point that I want to make is this. If you don't meet the merit qualifications, you're not getting in to the school. Regardless, if you're black, if you're Latino, there is a threshold that these colleges, and especially depending on which program you're applying to, they want you to meet. If you don't meet that threshold, you're not getting into those universities. You know who actually has more leeway in reference to college admissions? Not black applicants, not Latino applicants, right? It's not actually on the basis of race. It's on the basis of a legacy. And Bree's going to get into that. We're going to talk about the legacy admissions, which I never agreed with. I always thought it was bullshit. I never thought it was fair that you automatically get into the school because your parents are a legacy from this, because your leg legacy from the school, because your parent went there or your grandparents went there. And in fact, a lot of these elite academic institutions, a lot of these students that are admitted are legacy students. Let's get into it. Well, that's, not, that's, not equal, that's not equal, equally qualified people. Yes, it is. If you pass a bare minimum assessment of what it qualifies you to get into a school, you, like what I said, you can then move. Well, I'm talking more broadly than school. You got I'm more about points for things. your race than your ACT and SAT score. That, that is absolutely true. That's, that's not true, Robbie. It is, in fact, true. When you look at who is admitted to the. Uh, I got to agree with Bree on this one. That's actually not true. I, I don't know where that's coming from, but that has never been my experience. First of all, I'd love for I know you'd love for this racist statement from Robbie uh, uh, from Charlie Kirk to be uh, not the subject of the conversation. But what we're talking about is Charlie Kirk saying that pilots who attain the exact same number of flight hours and pass the exact same tests to get to become pilots who have no indication that their track record of crashes is higher than anybody else. As you pointed out in a recent episode, the number of planes that actually go down are so incredibly low that it's a statistical anomaly in the first instance. And I couldn't find any instances in which a black pilot was involved despite all of in, in a crash. Despite all of that, Charlie Kirk still feels comfortable saying that he is going to cast judgments and be concerned about whether or not he's going to die when he's in a plane piloted by a black person. And instead of taking nope. at that and looking at that and saying, well, maybe I should revise how I'm judging other people of minority backgrounds and other aspects of my life, and that that is my own internalized bigotry and racism, he's justifying it in a very similar way that you seem to be justifying it here, that saying, then saying the reality of affirmative action compels me to have a racist view uh, as I carry out my life. And all of that in the, in, the, in the face of obvious evidence that, for example, Raya Chaddock with no qualifications is being appointed to a, an important district position in Oklahoma. Well, what did I say and no evidence. Do that? And, and also with the evidence that something like 40 percent, I don't know, it's not something like actually 40 percent of Harvard admittees, uh, uh, people who are admitted to Harvard are either legacies or athletes. And they shouldn't but that is 100 percent correct. And I'm telling you guys, if you want to be angry about the admission system and who gets in and who doesn't get in, you need to start with the legs first. Start with the legacy applicants first. And I've said this time and time again, it is not fair. It is not fair that they get in just because their parent were, was able to attend that school. That's not right. And that's where a lot of these, some of these admissions, like she said, 40%, 40% of them, 40%. That's where you really got to raise the issue, the legacy admissions. So why aren't people like Bill Ackman upset about the legacy admissions in reference to these schools? You know why? Because Bill has a daughter and Bill's daughter goes to Harvard. And Bill went to Harvard. So Bill benefits from that system. And that's what it was all about, guys. That's what I was trying to tell you. It wasn't really about no plagiarism or none of that bullshit. It was about Bill Ackman trying to find a way to make sure 
that Jewish people in this country would benefit from the DEI system, rather at these universities or employment as well. The next person who interviews Bill Ackman need to ask him, how does he feel about legacy based admissions? That'll be a doozy. No one either. is, but no one is. Uh, what do you mean, no one? I here I am, a person saying that those all those things were a bad idea. No one outside of this table. The uh, overwhelming, the overwhelming force of the uh, the the uh, attacks from people like uh, Charlie Kirk and the people from his political cohort are attacking affirmative action. Where has Charlie Kirk or Christopher Rufo launched a national political campaign against legacy? Not performatively saying, oh, legacies are bad too, the way that you've just done, but actually asking for segments to be produced on this show, which has never happened, on the legacy crisis. I have, I don't see people in the wings saying, oh, we gotta do, we gotta do another legacy segment because it's such an unconscionable slight on the American education system. So that was interesting to hear. It sounds like Bree has wanted to talk about this before, the legacy admissions. I'm telling you, legacy admission is a big problem. It is a big problem. But it seems like um, it seems like the, the the folks at the Hill weren't interested in doing that. That so many people, poor, stupid, rich kids are getting allowed into school because their parents happen to go to those same kinds of schools. That is absolutely mm -hmm. not the kind of conversation we're having, and it's worth asking the question why the focus is specifically on race and at sometimes gender and very much so LGBT, LGBTQ people and not ever on the bulk of the college classes, which are made up of people who are, don't deserve to be there because, because there their was parents a are rich. legal justification for fighting it on the race grounds, given that racial discrimination is illegal and discrimination based on legacy status is not. I would be absolutely fine for all of those policies to be stripped away. And I've called for them to be stripped away over and over again. I support them being stripped away. So, so what are we having an argument about? But your about? contention is that there's no way to get rid of legacy programs. No, you, you want to get rid of the legacy Wait, no, programs and keep just there. the race-based No, your contention just there is there's no way to get rid, I want of, to get rid of both of them. Your contention just there is that there's no way to get rid of a legacy program because it is not a uh, legacy status is not a constitutionally protected status. And therefore, we shouldn't try to change policies in the United States of America. No, I didn't say we shouldn't try to change policy. So I think that's is, why they brought lawsuits so then what over is the, the race. No, so what is the excuse for not having people like Christopher Rufo ever trying to challenge those kind of policies? There are many ways to because there wasn't no a legal justification to that's do it. Not true. So let me explain something here. When you go to schools like MIT, you go to schools like Princeton, there are certain opportunities that are open to you that are not open to people that attend a school like the University of Massachusetts. It's just a reality. And the reason why I had that beef with the legacy admissions is because those kids get in just because of who their daddy is. That's not fair. It just, you know, you don't even have to be a top student. You get in because your daddy went there. If your application can get rejected, slim chance, but in the, in the chance that your application can get rejected, your daddy can make a call to the school. These things actually do happen. So you at birth, are already awarded certain opportunities that others are not because your dad went to this school. And people can say whatever they want, but I'm gonna keep it real for you. There are certain opportunities that are open to students that attend those elite academic institutions like a Stanford, like a Princeton, that are not open to people that go to some of these state schools. It is just a reality of the situation. Why do you think those schools are so expensive to begin with? Let's continue. You're saying that you can only challenge something if it's a constitutionally protected class. There's not any other kind of lawsuit that can be brought. There's not any other kind of protest. I mean, movement you love that can to happen. do. We can't do X until we can't. We do Y, and if we do, like, what are you talking what, about? This is the same thing as the um, as as the. But we can't hold anyone accountable for plagiarism until we have uh, Alan Dershowitz hauled before a what committee or something. What are you talking about? We should hold racial everybody discrimination accountable for is plagiarism. Wrong. I've said that they a They should not times. use racial. They should not practice racial discrimination in hiring or admissions. They fought to. 
to the, the, the law forbids it and a, a group of people who had been discriminated against in concert with conservative scholars, activists and groups, etc., fought to establish that policy, which I agree. All right. Sorry. Well, tough. You you agree. You and Charlie Kirk of one mind on this one. I see more. Right. Not on. No, 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 no. <laughs> We'll go ahead and uh, <laughs> we'll go ahead and stop it there. Uh, but if you want to see the rest of that video, that was funny. The rest of the video, it is uh, libs of TikTok named to Oklahoma Department of Education. Kirk suggests black pilots are unqualified. Yeah, it, it was a heated discussion, but uh, Brie was uh, funny there with uh, with that point. But yeah, I mean, again, from my experience, you still have to meet the merit qualifications, right? Same thing as to be a pilot. Obviously you still have to pass <laughs> the test. People don't just pick up someone off the street and say, he's black, you're hired. Like you still got to meet those qualifications. So that's an important piece there. Uh, good conversation though, between uh, Bree and Robbie. Thank you for the super chat NY varsity in 2019, the Saudis offered Trump a large amount of money to operate with the, with the Saudi against Yemen. Look up Trump pimps out soldiers. Interesting. Interesting. I agree with you, Zen Soulful. HR is a problem. Yes. <laughs> we could do a whole show about HR. I got some stories. You got some stories. We could do a whole show. Rondo says Bill Ackman's daughter was a DEI admission. <laughs> Oh man, you guys are cracking me up. 